Okay, great. Well, it's now <clears throat> time to start another Levine Electronics webinar. My name is Michael McClellan. It's so good to see all of you. <clears throat> I see a lot of uh, attendees uh, that we recognize that are uh, regulars, quote unquote, and I see uh, some new new names as well. So that's wonderful. Uh, thank you all so much for for attending. Um, we are so fortunate today uh, to get um, some time with Jorgen uh, Jorgen Madsen. Jorgen uh, is with ABB uh, Critical Power and has been um, in the U UPS industry all his life. It sounds like and uh, in both in Europe and in the states and. Uh, for different <clears throat> different manufacturers, so he has uh, he's seen he's seen a lot. A um, couple of housekeeping items that I forgot to mention. This is a webcast, so your phones are on mute. Um, however, we would love to hear from you. Uh, most of you are probably used to <clears throat> typing in questions into the question box, and if you're not, there is a button over on the left hand side of your screen where you can uh, press a button and type in a question and i'm sure that uh Jürgen would love to to answer it so um without further ado um here is Jürgen madsen of abb okay th thank you michael um and it, well not not to start out with excuses but i am flying a little bit blind here i i hope so I won't be able to see see anything other than the presentation. Uh, so, so, so Michael, I, I take it you are not muted. So, if if anything comes up or questions comes up, or uh, please please let me know. Um, yes, sir. I but will. Just 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 question. Can everybody hear me? Uh, and and the thing is. Uh, had some actually well still have problems connecting but but the the audio should work hopefully yes i think that everybody can hear you and okay. we're, on, we're still on the title slide um, okay the, the, yeah then then well th thank you Mike. thank you for the introduction and i think you you covered uh you, you covered it all um the i have been in this business for a very long time and seen a number of different things uh, and th there are changes, uh, I guess, to, to keep it less boring. Uh, things change a little bit over 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 time. So, uh, Michael, just if you could go to the uh, the second slide, which is um, get just the uh, it's it's the agenda, like basically what what I will uh, focus on today. Um, with the as this is. Uh, energy storage for UPS. I will talk a, just a little brief overview on the on the UPS side and what that is, what it does, and 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 how that has developed over the years. But the majority will be on the in a different energy storage solutions uh, for for UPS uh, and the different uh, the the different solutions we have used, still use, and uh, some of the new uh, some of the new things. So, so different types of batteries. Primarily, there are some mechanical uh, energy storage devices as well, and of course, the latest uh, and greatest, and what what everybody is talking about and wanting is lithium ion. Um, and there's there's some there's absolutely some benefits with that, but there's some some challenges. Um, if I guess we could call it that, that has been introduced by the authorities, actually for 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 good reasons, but we'll get into that. Uh, next slide, please. And that's just in like why UPS and what is a UPS. And and the, basically, a UPS is a filter. It'll take power from from uh, the typically utility uh, alternative, and in most data centers, there will be an emergency uh, power support also for, in case of a generator. So if utility power fails, the uh, generator will kick in, and then the uh, generator will start supporting or uh, supplying power to the UPS. The UPS will filter out that power no matter where it's coming from. Um, it'll take that power, 
and and filter it out and supply or support a clean uh, AC 480 or 208 volt to a critical load. Um, UPS is uninterrupted power supply, and what actually makes it uninterrupted is a, the little thing I circled in red at the bottom of this slide, and uh, the here battery, but that is the energy storage. So the basic function on, of the UPS, and this, this the single line is the double conversion online UPS, which is like 99 point something of the percent of UPSs in the market, uh, where the input AC power from the utility or the generator is coming to a rectifier. The rectifier will rectify that AC power to DC and feed it onto the inverter, and the inverter will then uh, chop it up and create a clean power for, for the critical load. Uh, what makes this whole device uninterrupted is that there are two power sources on that DC bus between the rectifier and the inverter. There's the rectifier, that's the normal mode, and if power fails uh, from utility or while switching to a generator or back again, the inverter will just take power from the battery. It doesn't care where the DC power is coming from. As long as there's DC power, it'll continue to feed clean power to the load. That's the basic function of the UPS. The last power module in a UPS is a static switch, and that, that's essentially if something happens down the road or downstream from the UPS that the inverter cannot handle, the UPS control will just, just transfer, it'll fire the static switch and, and transfer the load directly to utility power. Uh, so that can be in case of an overload or short circuit downstream. Um, and of course, smart UPS people figured out a couple of decades ago, uh, customers want high efficiency. When the UPS you know, is on the static switch or in, in what we refer to as in bypass, there are very little losses. Um, so the, this, is, uh, this is known as a market as economy mode. The UPS is in running. UPS in economy mode is running in bypass uh, in the normal mode. And then it can kick back, it can kick the inverter in, uh, in, in a matter of like less than a quarter cycle. So nothing that's critical, but nobody uses it because now they don't have the filter function of the UPS. They still have on it like, uh, protection in case of a power failure. So ne next slide, please. And that's just like, uh, a, uh, the red slide with the, uh, uh, a headline. So uh, slide five, next one. And little, just a little bit of history, just brief. That type of UPS, the double conversion online, had been around for coming up close to 60 years now. Um, and this, the um, just basic, they have developed a lot, but the single line pretty much have not changed. Or very, there's been very little change. The basic functionality is the same. Uh, the the difference is the quality and and performance of sem semiconductors that how they have developed over the last uh, close to 60 years. So UPS is used to be used to have a like what we call they they use what we would refer to as a transformer based UPS with a lot of magnetics and a lot of filters which were badly needed basically to to filter out harmonics and and to protect the fairly fragile uh, semiconductors that were used uh, in, in the early years. And then to, uh, to today, where, where we, we need very little filtering, we do not need the transformers anymore because we have rugged semiconductors, fast switching devices. And, and of course, the benefit is that we uh, footprint have gone down dramatically, weight have gone down dramatically, losses have gone down dramatically because we've gotten rid of a lot of that uh, heavy the, uh, the the heavy magnetics transformers and filters in in the UPS we don't need them anymore. The benefit and and I think there are actually still uh, a, one or two manufacturers that do offer transformer based UPSs they are going away. There's no doubt by far the majority of the market are transformerless today because everybody the, because of the what I just mentioned in. Um, Primarily the high efficiency, but but obviously weight weight and footprint matters matters as well. Uh, but the last benef benefit that the the that I like people like the fans of transformer based uh, UPSs is that with with a transformer based UPS you have galvanic isolation, uh, which allows a transformer based UPS to handle one extra failure mode that traditionally a transformer less UPS cannot do. 
uh, we, that's the reason I highlighted that here, is that a transformer-based UPS can actually handle a ground fault on the battery and still continue to uh, continue to function with no interruption. Uh, traditionally, that's not possible with a transformer-less UPS. There's no galvanic isolation. Uh, if there's a ground fault on the battery, the, the, the breakers will trip, fuses will, will blow, uh, the UPS will transfer to static bypass. And it'll continue to feed the load that way, but it cannot operate in its normal mode. The, the possible option, like to get somewhat back to the handling the fa the, that failure mode, is if the UPS uh, transformer is, is installed in what's like known as a high resistance grounding environment. Uh, which essentially means that instead of having a solid grounded uh, system, the system is grounded via a resistor that will limit the, the fault current uh, in case there is a ground fault, typically to around 5 amps. But, but if there's a ground fault, nothing will trip, nothing will shut down, the UPS will continue to operate, and everything will continue to operate. Um, but there's a ground fault, and there's ground current, but because of the resistor is limited. The, the, the most modern UPSs, uh, like can operate in that mode and actually can even operate in that mode, even if there's a ground fault on the battery. So it's not, not entirely, it, it requires that special application with a high resistance grounding. Uh, but we are back to where the, the, in that mode or in that case, the UPSs can actually, uh, handle a, a, a ground fault on the, on the DC side as well. So. There was a little bit around the UPS. Uh, if you go to slide six, please. And that's uh, lit actually just like <laughs> a trip down memory line, a little bit about what I, I talked about before, like how efficiency has been the driver uh, of, of development of, of new generations and technologies, topologies for UPS. Uh, and essentially the main reason for this is that, that developing better uh, semiconductor devices from the back in the 60s where UPSs, the power models were SCR based thyristors to, to bipolar transistors and now lately ID, IDBTs. So where most UPSs are today is the red box, uh, the third from the top, uh, transformerless UPS with, with three level IDBT uh, power, power modules. Um, there's there's a next uh, generation semiconductor around the corner. There's actually there's actually a one UPS out based on this topology uh, that the can drive the efficiency a little higher. Uh, most UPSs today are around 96.5, give or take uh, between 96.5 and 97 in online efficiency with silicon carbide, which is the next uh, generation uh, semiconductors. We can get up around 98. But they're very expensive, so so it's no doubt that will be the future. But when we uh, uh, they're not competitive price wise yet, it doesn't justify the the gain in efficiency. And then of course there's the big gorilla in the room, the the green one on top. Get to 99 percent, but now you're in bypass. So so it's most UPSs, all ABB UPSs can do that, but very few customers uh, want to do that. That's not why they bought a UPS. And then next slide. Um, and this just because this is ABB. Um, so, so just a quick view of, of the, of the ABB UPS offering. Um, ABB offers both monoblock and monolithic type UPSs. Um, uh, and we have three families there. We have the TLE mid power, TLE high power and, and the megaplex, uh, where the, the mid power is, Available from 40 to 150 kVA. The uh, high power TLE starts at 160, goes to a megawatt, and the the megaflex, uh, which is the the latest uh, child, I guess you can say, on, in the product family, from from 1100 kVA, 1.1 megawatt to 1.6 megawatt, and the that's actually the um, uh, that megaflex is a unit where. Uh, that this, it's the most modern UPS is designed that it can operate uh, out, right out of the gate in in a high resistance grounding environment, uh, as I mentioned before, with uh, it being able to handle ground fault on the on the battery. It'll 
it'll have to be in a high resistance grounded or similar grounded um, in a solidly grounded environment that with the transformless GPS that's that's, um, that's only bypass that. So all all ABB UPS is the ones on, on this slide and, and the following slide are what I talked about, high level IDBT based inverters, very high efficiency, uh, power factor corrected in, uh, and unity power factor rated. And I just noticed, uh, which I, I guess most of the people on the call will um, will know that ABB acquired GE Industrial Solutions um, uh, just about over two years ago now. Uh, and I still have some of the old pictures in my slide here. The the ABB UPS offering today is a combination of what was the what we refer to as a legacy AB, ABB and and legacy GE. So so part of the offering is uh, actually legacy GE UPS. It's two of the boxes here. Uh, the TLEs are actually uh, from from the the GE side. The Megaflex is from is ABB. And if you go to the next slide, Michael. Uh, the uh, legacy ABB UPS is uh, all ABB UPS is uh, in in the north like legacy ABB UPS is one modular type modular scalable type uh, products, and that what that means is that the the uh, the black box in the middle uh, is a 500 kW. It actually consists of five, of five individual 100 kW modules, or in the ABB case. The individual UPSs. So electrically, this would be like if we took five uh, of the TLE 100 kWs uh, and put them in parallel. Uh, and it's not the same. It's not the same power unit. It's not. It's a different, uh, uh, different design altogether. Much, much more compact. Um, but, but that's that's the that's the basic design of the ABB modular UPS. It's small UPSs in one frame. The frame is just holding the modules and, and then having land, uh, landing space for the cables. 208 volt offering, 480 volt offering. And the, the picture on the right, the, these are parallel, just showing a, a row of parallel UPSs. These are the modular, but all, all the ABB UPSs can be paralleled uh, for additional power uh, or additional uh, redundancy. And then onto the, what we are talking about today, uh, energy storage. And starting out by looking at some of the, um, like the, the stuff that's been around for a long time. Uh, the, uh, I'm on slide 10 now, uh, showing nickel cadmium and, and flutter lead acid batteries. Uh, where the, the nickel cadmium, like both, both types of batteries have been around for a very long time and have actually changed very little over, over, over very, over a lot of decades. Um, and that, that's, I guess, probably no reason to waste an awful lot of time on nickel cadmium batteries. We, we hardly ever see them in UPS applications. I've, like in my, in my, and that's a few decades also, I've seen one. Um, and the the only reason that uh, the that UPS in an IT environment was installed with a nickel cadmium, cadmium was that the um, it was actually it was the customer was a battery manufacturer that made nickel cadmium batteries. So so um, it's possible all UPSs can can work with nickel cadmium batteries, but they uh, there there's some 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 issues. There's some benefits with nickel cadmium. Uh, they have very long life and they are rugged, uh, especially temperature wise. Um, so I haven't seen them much in, in traditional IT, uh, environment. I've seen them on UPSs in, uh, in areas of the world rugged environment where it was very hot. Uh, and, and at that time, mostly when the alternative was another lead acid, was a lead acid battery. That acid batteries generally do not handle uh, hot, uh, high temperatures very well. So the the there are a couple of drawbacks with nickel cadmium. Um, one, they're they are very expensive, uh, which of course shies a lot of customers away. But secondly, cadmium is really not good for anything. Well, it is, but it's not healthy. Uh, it's toxic. So and actually outlawed in some in some markets in Europe. So so they are we don't see that we don't see that a lot. What we have seen a lot more are the flooded wet cells, which 
clearly was the dominant battery in in the market uh, in in the UPS or IT market. Uh, if we go back a couple of decades, uh, things have changed a little bit, but the the this was the way to go. Um, and whether it was a UPS application or a telco uh, back back office, it it was the the glass uh, house uh, glass cabinet uh, ba- batteries. Facility managers loved them because they could actually see inside the battery, see what was going on. Uh, they have they have good life, uh, which is absolutely a part a, a plus. Uh, but the, the the reasons customer like them uh, is that. If they fail, or the failure mode of a cell in a wet cell battery is typically uh, a shorted, a shorted cell, which means that in a UPS battery where you typically in the U.S. have 240 cells in series, like the weakest link in the chain can will break the chain. But if it's a wet cell battery and a cell fails and it's and it shorts out. Now you just instead of having 239, you have uh, or 240. Now you have 239 cells in the strength, and the UPS can still operate with that. But of course, that cell, that cell needs to be replaced. The 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 drawback and the reason we don't we still see them. There are still customers, uh, especially in the financial and by, uh, financial world, that that's where to the uh, to the flooded wet cell batteries. Um, but they require separate battery rooms. <coughs> Uh, they require hydrogen monitoring. They require ventilation. They require spill containment. Uh, they re- require um, like eyewash stations. A lot. They they uh, they take a lot of space. They're big. They're heavy. They require a a lot of maintenance. Also, somebody has to run around and tub up the water. So so they they used to be the like the that was a given uh, a couple of decades ago. It's been less and less. Uh, and then moving on to the uh, the battery that has replaced like a, a lot of the um, uh, of the wet cells, the VRLA, which is on, still a lead acid battery, um, it's just a lot easier to hand to to deal with. Um, there's no tubbing up of water. They are, and actually should say there's some there's there's a, like a common misunderstanding in the market that it, they then some call them sealed batteries, they're not. Like V, the V does not stand for shield. Uh, there's a valve there, and they can vent. But generally, uh, the it's an internal recom, uh, recombination with, uh, as the do, during the discharge and the recharge of the cell. So they they are they're easy to deal with. Uh, they are typically installed in a steel cabinet, uh, matching and unmatching can be next to the UPS. Don't do not require separate battery rooms typically, um, so they're just the the they clearly taken over the majority of the market and and primarily well one they are cheaper than wet cells uh, two uh, they are a lot easier they are a lot easier to deal with. The the drawbacks uh, is that when a cell in a in a VRLA fails it typically fails open. And that's back to my comment before about the weakest link in the in the chain will will take you down. So so the the way around that is that VRLA batteries are typically installed uh, with like three or four cabinets or strings in parallel. So even if one cell or one battery should fail and take out that string, there's still runtime available for the for the UPS. Uh, but the drawback is that they are very sensitive to temperature. They really like the temperature to be around 70, between 72 and 77. Uh, and, and if, if it, uh, it really affects the life of the battery, uh, if, if temperature goes, uh, goes above that, it, it shortens the life dramatically. They actually work better. Like the chemistry works better at a higher temperature, but, but there's very little life. Uh, and of course, we have all experienced how on a lead acid battery, how temperature affects the performance of the battery. Uh, at least where I live, if I start, try to start my car on a cold winter morning, there's not much juice on the battery at that time. Uh, but the, the, this is by far the dominant, uh, energy storage solution in the, in the UPS market today. And then what we've seen in, go to the next slide, please, slide 12. What we've seen in later years 
is a, a type of VLA battery uh, that's like a pure pure lead battery, uh, also also known as a thin uh, thin plate uh, battery. It's a VLA battery. Uh, it ad it addresses some of the uh, uh, issues with the traditional VLA battery. Um, the uh, they they are typically more robust temperature wise. Uh, there are actually special versions that that are. are uh, can operate all the way up to to 60 degrees, of course, which with shorter life. But generally, they can handle more, but of a temperature swing than a traditional VLA, and they have a they have a better performance. Um, they are based on pure lead, so so it's just it's the the fact that they are based on pure lead uh, that just generally overall better uh, quality of the material that's used in the battery, and then that the uh, the plates are thinner, so typically for the same same size battery, there will be bit, uh, like between fifty and seventy percent more plate in the in the battery, so more surface area, uh, which means better performance for the battery. We we are we are seeing them uh, the the one one benefit, and it'll tie into actually we might as well go to the next slide, um, slide thirteen. Um, with a with a with a fancy French word coup de foie, uh, which is something that like some data center, some facility managers have learned the hard way. And and what it is is like the in in a lead acid battery, uh, it is chemistry. So when the UPS suddenly needs power, it's a load step on the battery, and the chemistry needs to wake up before the battery really can start to perform and and supply power to the UPS. So it's also known as whiplash. I guess that's better uh, uh, better English. The volt we actually see that the voltage for the battery string drops uh, and then recoups, and then you have the discharge where where it goes down towards the um, the cutoff voltage, and the cutoff is as low as the inverter is able to go. Uh, the lowest DC voltage or battery voltage it can operate from. So the 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 could afford depends on the size of the battery relative to the load, um, and and because of this, uh, lead acid batteries historically have not been able to be sized for less than five minutes of runtime, uh, and that's five minutes end of life. So, with with the in the VR like in the wet cell world, and actually for quite a while, that 15 minutes of runtime was was standard. Um, but as the the batteries really only needed to fill the gap between losing power and starting the generator, and 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 vice versa, nobody really needs 15 minutes. So so runtime requirements have gone down to the absolute minimum. And for VLA or for lead acid battery, that is five that is that five minutes. And the five minute limit is that if you go lower than that, we get into the picture we have here where the voltage actually drops when the, when the load first hits the battery and can drop below the DC cutoff. Like there are several facility managers who have, uh, can tell stories about data center load drops because of this. The battery was there, it worked, but it had just grown weaker over the years and just could not support the voltage uh, at that initial uh, load step. So the 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 reason for bringing that up is that the the pure lead because they like the thin plate because there are more plates plates and and bigger surface area they they still have the they still an issue but it's not as it's not as dramatic uh, as it is with a traditional uh, lead acid battery so with with pure lead and probably the main reason we are seeing people starting to look at them even if they are a little bit more expensive is that we can now size a battery all the way down to two minutes, where with a traditional VLA uh, cannot go below five minutes of, of uh, with, with before running into issues with like potential issues with could have And then onto the next slide, uh, 14. Which uh, is Jürgen, does just, the pure lead battery, does it fail open or does it fail closed? Same, same failure mode as it's a VLA battery, it fails open. Okay, great. So, so you know what? The, 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 typically, it fails open. Like there are no, not, it's not a hundred percent. There's no guarantee that a wet cell will fail, face fail shorted. But 
in they practically always do and and the VLAs practically always fail open so, so it it's a uh, and and it is a the pure lead is a VLA battery it's a, it's the same thing about so the the slide 14 is is just ha like listing some of the uh, some of the things that I I just talked about with the with the different uh, with the different batteries uh whether it's a top or front terminal a VLA doesn't make a big difference. We talked about some of the benefits of going to the uh, the pure lead. The and it's the, the it's mainly that we can actually size the battery closer to what is really needed for the application, um, and which is not it 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 doesn't need to be five minutes. Of course, it's it's nice to have a little bit of uh, cushion and lack of lack of a better word, but what uh what for most data center or facility managers like if the generator doesn't start uh five minutes or fifty even fifteen minutes are likely not gonna help you people are just gonna run around screaming for a little longer until they crash um so and 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 that and then the the stricter competition with the the way the market has changed from a Corporate type, where every every company or corporation has their own data center, to um, colo and and cloud type designs today, where the data center actually is a revenue generator, and and not only the operating cost, but the capital, the capex is as as important when colo one is competing for colo two. So so nobody installs a 15 minute battery if they think they can com they can they can get by with a 5 or 2 or 2 minute and they can and then with the uh, looking at we talked about the flooded well cell and the nicad there are a lot of similarities between between the two um interesting and that actually goes across the board is that in the in the in the ups world for bad battery energy storage we talk about battery design life and and funny enough, nobody expects to get the battery to live that long. Um, VRLA is typically ten year design life, and most most customers swap batteries every four years. Some actually even every three years. Sometimes you get a little bit more out of them, but they typically live about half the design life, and that's true for most of them. But with the with the the pure lead, you get a little bit more. Uh, it looks they're fairly new, but it looks like you get a little bit more life. Then with with the uh, traditional lead acid, and then with the flooded and the nitrate, tip like twelve years life is is not uncommon, uh, but it's a tw like sold as a twenty year design life battery, and then of course as we move from left to right, price goes up. So moving on to the next slide and to the uh, just goes goes continue to slide sixteen, um, which like we call a like it's called here a mechanical battery or flywheel and this is like kinetic energy storage um have been around for quite a while have been used for a lot of different uh like in in a number of different like, like flywheels are not new right they've been around for a long time um but in this case it's just uh accelerating a mass in the like a flywheel um and then there there are not a lot of players in this market uh the and but they can be they can be steel they can be composite um and and uh, rega regardless so so the 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 weight and the of course the size depends on the on the material cho chosen um but the flywheel then is that it, it'll include a motor and a generator maybe a combined unit uh a motor to accelerate the flywheel up to that's been flywheels that that's with are spinning up up about uh, fifty thousand rpm uh the a b b are the, the solution that a b b offers up are just around thirty seven thousand rpm um they the the typically ap typical application or typical uh backup time with a flywheel is a fifty second uh application um of course flywheels like batteries can of like batteries like UPSs, but batteries also can be paralleled and 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 add to the uh to, to the runtime um 
there, there are benefits. There are customers using flywheels, actually very, very little, very few in the IT world. It happens, but we see them a lot more in, in the healthcare sector. Uh, but good rugged devices have benefits with a, with a flywheel. Uh, they're typically 20 year design life and they, they live for 20 years. It, so that's a major difference compared to the, um, to, to the batteries where the, the actual life typically is half of the design life or maybe a little bit more. Uh, the, and, and there's, there's no toxic material other than there's electronics, but, but lead is not, uh, we have a very good recycling, uh, system for lead, but it's, it, but it, it is toxic. Uh, the, the flywheel is, is a nice green solution when, when it comes to that. On the, on the flip side, they, it's not a cheap solution, uh, and comp- comparing, uh, and I, w- I will, I think I have a later slide on that, um, with a 15 second versus a, a, a five or seven minute uh, with a battery, it's still that 15 second solution is still significantly more expensive. Uh, the the short backup time is a concern. Like the data center facility managers are not comfortable with that. Uh, in in a hospital setting uh, where the generators required to be up and running in 10 seconds, they seem to be a little uh, no, actually a lot more comfortable. With just having a, that 15 second um, gap filler or protection while the generator starts. Uh, as I mentioned, there are not a lot of manufacturers of, uh, of, of, of the flywheels out there. And let's go to the, the next slide. There's a slide 17. Just shows a, a little bit more detail um, the, uh, the rotor in the, in the flywheel is, is actually. Um, it's not running on, be- there are bearings in there, but in the normal mode, it's floating. It's it's uh, like hanging in free air. Actually, it's hanging in a magnetic field. So there's, there's no resistance, and this is to get the losses down in the, um, as it is in the, it, in the standby uh, or backup application. And, and the idea is not to have more losses than absolutely necessary. Um, by having it floating um, or in that hanging in a magnetic field, there's very little, um, there's very little inertia, very little uh, energy is required to keep it spinning. Um, the the best use and where we see them, as I said, is for very for very short backup. Like typically, it gets very expensive when we start looking at more than 15 second backup. It's actually expensive already at that point. Uh, but I, I mentioned hospitals as a typical application, not not so much IT. Actually, one thing to to bear in mind here that the with the UPS, make sure this is something that has tested and and uh, and and uh, approved by the UPS vendor. Uh, not all UPSs understand flywheels, and so there's the there's in the flywheel there's electronic that takes whatever power, whether it's AC or DC, coming from the generator driven by the the uh, the flywheel. Uh, and con- and converting that to DC power, so so it it looks like a battery for the UPS. It, it when the battery is, when the UPS is charging and accelerating, it's accelerating the flywheel, and when it when it needs power, it's it's just deaccelerating the the flywheel, and and the flywheel is generating DC power. But but in as most UPSs are designed to operate with batteries, they usually have a little bit of time. They don't they're not in a hurry. When when they uh, are, go from a battery mode to a ut- to back on utility or generator power, uh, and take their due time figuring like just making sure that the power is available before they kick in the rectifier and then start have the rectifier start feeding power to the uh, to the inverter. The um, uh, the uh, and and with a flywheel where they only have fifteen seconds. Uh, the UPS has to be able to be programmed to operate quick enough for that. Uh, so it's just a, that it's been a, a surprise in a, co- in a couple of cases, like his, his, historically uh, with the, with the ABB UPS is that the, that, that setting is, uh, is available. And then to slide 18. Hey, Jürgen, just, uh, you, do you yes. also see, uh, do you also see super caps? Uh, sometimes used to provide we, uh, this function. 
we super caps we no actually it they are they are in a um, if you're looking for one to two seconds and or make they are competitive for flywheels they're not really a match in in the battery world at least not yet like once in a great while uh, we we see the the articles about somebody came up with it with like a brilliant new design for super caps and they're now going to replace everything it's it's not panned out yet so there are super cap solutions out there, and and we actually use them in some of our industrial UPS uh, solutions, where they're just filtering out. Like if there's a power failure, that that's <laughs> it's that's nothing you can do. But if as long as it's just it's like a a like a few cycles or a second glitch, super caps are a pretty good solution. Not, not com- price wise uh, cannot cannot compete in the in this world. So the this the slide eighteen is actually just a repeat uh, like highlighting a number of the uh, things I said just comparing the the flywheel with the VLA which is currently the most popular solution um, and with with the with the benefits that that I that I mentioned typically the flywheels are rugged they can actually handle very wide t- uh, temperature variations. Um, and they act. They are designed for very long life. They don't require a lot of maintenance. Um, they're not cheap though. And and in in the IT world, the have not yet become co- uh, comfortable with only having 50 seconds uh, of, of backup time. Price wise, uh, they're not really competitive anyway. Uh, and then on to the interesting, like the new things, and it's not maybe that new, but it's fairly new to this market, lithium-ion batteries. So, so go straight to slide 20. And for a lot of people, just I had to throw the pictures in there. For a lot of people, this is what we, <laughs> this is what we see. Like it make it it makes the news every time. And if it's not on the news, there are YouTube videos out there. Uh, so what everybody knows that lithium-ion batteries burn very well. And and they're actually pretty hard to put out when they do catch fire. Um, there are a lot of benefits with them, but but clearly there are some challenges. It's a lot of energy crammed into a fairly compact space. So so in the coming slides, I'll cover some of the the features, uh, the pros and cons with uh, with lithium ion battery. But um, the for the lithium ion battery industry, like unfortunately, the picture that that stands out in most picture, people's minds are the are the pictures on on the right of this slide. So go to slide twenty one, please. And this is actually this may be known for for most of you. This is just copy paste off uh, from batteryuniversity dot com. It's like battery lithium ion batteries are not new. They actually they they're coming up on the thirty year anniversary. Um, uh, but they have significant benefits compared to uh, uh, to the traditional to the traditional batteries. Um, uh, like they they don't the they're very low maintenance. There's no gassing, which is uh, gassing is an issue with uh, with all like all other types of batteries. Uh, they have they like to be cycled. They have high cycle life. Um, and they don't have memory, which is an issue. Didn't talk about that, but that is an is an issue with uh, with lead acid battery. If you do, if you repeat the same cycle, the battery kind of gets in that mode. Um, the some of the drawbacks is that they they do like you can't install an a lithium ion battery without a battery management system. It it needs to it needs to be monitored and monitored and controlled. Uh, but going to the to the next slide. Uh, and this just kind of highlighting some of the um, the features uh, and d- drawbacks with the with lithium ion. So first, lithium ion is not just lithium ion batteries. There are a number of different flavors. Uh, typically, a lithium metal oxide something uh, combination. Uh, and so these are the the three listed here: the LMO, NMC, and the LFP. Um, uh, are just the, here that I'll get a little bit more into the different types, but those are the three most popular ones for the application, like for UPS applications. Um, the in the in the design, the lithium ion batteries that they for the UPS world, they are typically designed for a five to seven minute uh, starter life. 
and they don't live forever. They ha- one of the, the benefits is that they live, they have a lot longer life than a VRLA battery. Uh, they're still new, so, so the market is still learning, but, but so far, um, expect it looks pretty good. Uh, and of course, if the world has good experience, we're using lithium ion in, in a number of other applications. Uh, but on the benefit side, and the reason uh, a lot of people are interested and want to actually do use lithium ion batteries is that. They are very, they're compact. Uh, they're very light. Uh, like li- weight is often, um, a quarter of it, a, an equivalent BLA. They're very compact, typically less than half the footprint and, and footprint is expensive. Um, the design life for most of the manufacturers and there are a number of companies making lithium ion batteries, uh, is five, uh, is 15 years. Uh, and you can usually get a 10 year warranty on, on, on that 15 year battery. Um, and f- from what we are seeing so far, is they they seem to ha- like to get there easily. That it's expected that they probably will uh, support a 15-year active life. Uh, still, still early in in this application, but based on on uh, experience with other applications and and the ex- experience so far, it's probably going to work out. Um, they. Again, compared to the VLA, they, they are more robust temperature-wise. You can operate them at, at higher temperatures at a VLA. It will still affect the life of the battery, but not, they are a lot more rugged than VLA batteries. They have very high cycle life, which may not be as interesting in a, in a backup application like a UPS application, but the cycle life is typically 10, 8 to 10 times uh, of what we see with a, uh, uh, with a VLA. So say a VRLA is designed or will handle 300 cycles, a lithium ion battery would then typically can be up around 3,000 cycles of like cycle life. There's no gassing and and the other benefit is that at least there's no gassing in the normal mode. If they fail, there will be gassing. Um, The uh, the other benefit is that the, the recharge time can be very, very fast. So if the battery has been discharged, it can be recharged very fast to be able to support the next outage. That, uh, that, that, that's, an, that's another benefit, especially in critical applications like this. On, on the flip side, um, they are fairly new in the UPS industry, which we're still learning. Uh, they are, and, and, and a lithium ion battery solution is the solution. It's a battery in a cabinet with it, with its, with its monitoring. It's not like a lead acid off the shelf, uh, like 300 amp hour battery is, is are the same dimension, uh, like f- physical dimension and, and almost weight, no matter what manufacturer and pretty much, and, and off the shelf in a lot of different places. A, a, so, so it's not, a, there's not the same flexibility. A lithium ion battery is, 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 uh, bought or sold as a system. Uh, and what I will get a little bit more into, there's some stricter standard, except especially the last year, uh, that, uh, puts, um, like more, like stricter requirements, especially on lithium ion batteries. We'll, we'll get into that. The other thing that, like, there's, we see articles about rare, uh, rare earth, um, some of the materials used are, um, scarce, like, especially cobalt, uh, so, that that's a little bit of a concern um but we've uh, there are enough like i mentioned there are a number of different designs different configurations generally uh and actually i went to slide 23 uh and just an, a an illustration of of a lithium ion battery it's that like any other battery there's an anode and a cathode uh there's an electrolyte uh where ions can float in the electrolyte and there's there's a separator between the anode and the cathode uh and it's just uh that allows only the ions to pass between the two the chemistry is different and and the li- listing here is just showing some of them i think i've seen a, and i'm not a hunt, like a list of like different combinations and chemistries uh, somewhere between 15 and 20 of them by now. And I'm sure we'll see more in the future. Um, and they, there's a reason for that. Uh, so go, go to the next slide. Um, this, uh, slide 24 
shows, and this is just again, it, it's not all twenty uh, of or fifteen or however many they are, but some of the more popular uh, seen today, like the, the uh, lithium cobalt oxide, the LCO, was your original lithium ion battery. So if 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 in my cell phone, that's probably the type of battery that's in there. That's typically where that is used. So so that's the reason. Like we look at the different chemistries have different. Uh, qualities and uh, like uh, features and and benefits, and depending on the application, uh, the the we can pick the chemistry that that supports what what we need. So the the three like the LMO like on the right the bottom like the LMO the NMC and partly the L, 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 LFP are probably the most no they they no doubt they are the most commonly seen in UPS. Uh, and and by the energy storage like grid energy storage solutions um sometimes uh the sometimes even combination of chemistries uh like combinations of of uh, of lmo and nmc to get a good energy but also good power we need good power in for for ups battery so it can handle the um the short like it's a power battery it's short time backup backup time supporting a ups Whereas if it's an energy storage grid, grid level battery, that's more of an energy battery. So the chemistry is picked depending on the, the application. For UPS applications, uh, those three are, are what we will see the most. Uh, of course, safety is, is important and we'll get a little bit, we'll get a little bit back to that as well. So. Actually, on that one side, the, the nickel cobalt aluminum, if, if you drive an electric vehicle, there's a good chance that that, uh, that type of battery you have, you, you have in your electric vehicles. Uh, they f Different chemistries fit in, 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 in different applications. So move on to slide 25 um, and just looking a little bit more into the, um, uh, the, the benefits uh, and to slide 26 of lithium ion batteries. I mentioned I, I, I probably mentioned most most of this all already, but the the main uh, that is that they are compact, they are light, uh, uh, they live significantly longer. Uh, like with a, with an IT type UPS today, the design life is is generally fifteen year fifteen years across the board, and and a lithium ion battery now is expected to uh, to live. The, as long as the UPS, no no battery replacements uh, should be needed. Um, they they do require a, a built-in battery management system uh, for safety reasons, um, but of course that also means that that it's already included in the packet and can be used to communicate information to the to the user, to the facility manager, to, or, or also via the UPS, uh, what whatever is uh, whatever is preferred. And then on to slide uh, 27. Uh, through that in there, it, it's actually just comparing the, the batteries I talked about on, until now, it's like nickel cadmium, the different uh, lead, uh, lead acid batteries and lithium ion. And just to show that the, the lithium ion, which is a red one here, it, it checks all the boxes. Um, the only one, and actually I think, I guess, I think this slide is actually a year or two old. It, it's the pricing for for lithium ion is, is coming down as as volume uh, and and the, in more and more batteries are, are manufactured. As volume volume goes up, the overall cost is coming down. So they they there are a lot of benefits to lithium ion batteries. And go on to slide 28. And and I. The, so this this slide is not is actually a couple of years old, but it was it was data based on a project and the which include that included a one megawatt UPSs, mm. and for the customer it was just comparing different solutions. Uh, with the two left are VLA type top terminal and front terminal, and and the custom like the calculations was about what is the total cost of ownership for this over fifteen years, and. The the so for the batteries the VLAs on the left the flywheel is number three and and then the lithium ion all the way out at the right. The for the batteries this is like minimum runtime uh, uh, for the VLAs and and the lithium ion is at the same uh, 
uh, same level, uh, six, six minutes, five, six minutes in the uh, beginning of life. The flywheel is only, that's a 15 second uh, so- solution. But over 15 years, uh, assuming which at, at this point, most people expect that we will have a 15 year life of the battery. The total cost of ownership of the of the lithium mine is beats beats the other players in the market. Um, so and and it's only going to get better. At least that's the expectation that pricing is continued to go, uh, to go down. Uh, next slide, please. And just this just another another way of showing the same. Uh, the the little square out on this is slide twenty nine out out in the right corner is what I just talked about the. The lithium ion battery is like the upfront cost. First cost is a little higher, but if you look at the TCO over the life of the system, it's uh, it's lower. It it beats it beats all, all other solutions. And then of course the other uh, bars uh, on the left side of the of this slide just highlight some of the other other benefits. Actually, the low weight could really mean a, mean a financial benefit also. If if the building needs to be reinforced to support the 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 lead. And does not have to be that uh, with with a uh, with a lithium ion battery. So moving forward, uh, next slide. And so now we're getting into the the <laughs> the, the lithium ion battery. So I'm slide thirty and thirty. And you you can uh, Michael, you can just continue to thirty one. The lithium ion world and UPS world, by the way, everybody was moving a, uh, moving ahead full steam uh, with lithium ion battery, and that with all the benefits that I just mentioned, that's that's there's a lot of interest for this, obviously. Uh, um, and as 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 TGO keeps coming down, people tend to forget the uh, the two flaming pictures and a few and the others we've all seen. So what happened last year, NFPA passed a new standard, 855, that put with some pretty um, strict requirements on, on, on batteries. On stationary, it's a stationary energy storage system. So, it, it, and, and, and so it's across the board. It's not only lithium ion, but the, but the standard is stricter for lithium ion. And, and, and one difference is that it applies for lithium ion batteries uh, we, if the total capacity energy of the battery is over 20 uh, kilowatt hours. Um, and for, for uh, VRLA, for lead acid battery, the same requirement, it, the 855 applies, but only if the battery is, is bigger than 70 kilowatt hours. And, and by the way, if this is a UPS battery and UPS, the UPS, UL for UPS is a 1778, they're listed to 1778. The bad, the VRLA battery can be listed to 1778 as well. And if it is, then 855 doesn't apply. So, but, but 855, the requirement is with, with a lithium ion battery, um, it, it applies for, for anything over 20 uh, kilowatt hour. The groups of batteries uh, or battery cabinets uh, over 50 kilowatt hour uh, have to be separated away uh, from from each other and from walls uh, three feet away. Uh, and there's a requirement that they will not allow more than a total capacity of 600 kilowatt hours in one room. Um, so with that, the the so lithium ion obviously is still lighter, but the footprint now is suddenly bigger than the VRLA. So that benefit went went away with, with this. Um, but there are some ways around that, uh, and and everybody's still learning. Uh, so there are no guarantees, and I'll I'll get, I'll get to that also. Eight fifty five, and actually I should say the the International Fire Code two thousand eighteen actually does not reference eight fifty five. But it has some very similar requirement about the like 50 kilowatt hour and three foot spacing or feet spacing between the, the cabinets. Um, so and for like with the 600 uh, kilowatt hour maximum, we uh, that's a total. So for a large data center, that that'll support like four to five megawatts of UPS. So so with a like a, a one megawatt UPS, we would typically need four or five. Uh, cabinets and they would have to be split, spaced apart uh, if complying to 855 as without anything else. Um, 
so the what's what's also part of mentioned is the in in eight fifty five is that if the battery is uh, tested according to u l ninety five forty eight and a ninety five forty eight is not a listing it's a testing method uh, that focuses on uh the the it's a, it's the it's testing at cell level uh battery level cabinet level and total system level that that you have to force a thermal runaway in one of the lithium ion battery cells and prove that it does not propagate to other cells or other cabinets <laughs> and that and and so what what manufacturers and everybody's listening to this or, or doing the testing we have to have or no, actually lithium ion manufacturers have to um what they get out of that is is a test report that that uh well if we are not going to see it if it doesn't say that the, that the battery solution doesn't propagate uh and and states very low gas emissions if there's a fault uh and very low heat the ABB do offer lithium ion batteries and they have been tested to 9548. We can, we can support that or, or uh, submit that, that report. 9540, and there's a lot of confusion about this. 9540 is actually a, a UL listing and that's for a total system. The market is not quite sure how it's going to handle this right now. It looks like the way the code is written is that the local AHJ can approve a, like wave the three foot cl space clearing, wave the 600 uh, kilowatt hour capacity limit. If if the if he's happy with what he's seeing in the 9540A um, uh, test report, he doesn't have to, but he can. So so and 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 the AHJs, uh, the the work, I guess the uh, everybody in this business is 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 in learning mode and figuring out how to handle this. So lithium ion batteries are not going to go away. We don't expect that there would be a problem with installing them next to each other again with after passing the test and 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 especially uh, especially if they are listed like they have the 9540 listing, which requires not only the battery but it has to be listed together with the UPS or if it's if it's an energy storage system together with the uh, uh, with the inverter. And then to the next slide, which I think is the last one. And it, it's so it, it's just a couple of things uh, to to bear in mind. Um, as I mentioned, the market, the, the world is still learning. The U.S. market is still learning about this 855. Uh, and and as it's new, it was passed last year. It's not in it's not referenced in the in the latest version of the IFC, like the 2018 or in the National Fire Code. But it will be in the it will be referenced in the next ones. And the the current I uh, I and like International Fire Code 2018 had very similar requirements. So so, but not all jurisdictions have adopted the latest version. So so that okay. Do we have this like because the old uh, uh, the the old IFC and and it's section 1206 in the in the new one. The old one it it was 608 does not mention anything about this. Um, so so the the um, in the code, it actually states that it's not supposed to be retroactive, and that's section 141. Um, but right below that, it also states that the AHJ can actually still, if he thinks this is a required, he can he he can still make it retroactive. So so right now, until the market figures out, um, until there's some precedent set or some common practices for how do we handle this and what do we do. The, before anybody installs a big LED, uh, lithium ion battery, they should, they should talk to the local AHJ as early as possible in the process and get acceptance before moving forward. We don't, like, nobody really expects this to be a problem. Nobody expects the NFPA, like, to be retroactive. But the way it's worded is nothing's really certain right now. And then, of course, the, I only talked about the, the uh, uh, NFPA the, and, the, and the fire code. There could be other codes. Like I know lo locally, um, the uh, and I, I live upstate New York, but in New York City, the fire marshals will not accept lithium ion batteries in a building. Period. Uh, it doesn't matter. Um, so there, there's it, there's there's legwork to be done be before installing a lithium ion 
they're not going away. And that's just my personal opinion. Like there, there's so many benefits to this, um, that the, this, uh, the, there's just, and there's good reason to add this, mainly because of the, the experience that how bad things can really go. Um, but the elite amount, the manufacturers have improved the, uh, the safety in, in the batteries so that they, they passing that full, that full scale failure test, um, makes it's a, it's a, it's a pretty safe, uh, it's a pretty safe solution as energy storage in, in the UPS as well. And I'm sorry, I went over time, but that was the last slide. The last, the next one is a, uh, uh, question mark. I think if, if anybody is still on and, and anybody may have questions to this. Can you hear the phones? I, I heard you. Yeah, I was curious about environmental insult. And in other words, uh, lithium lithium mining is supposed to be pretty uh, tragic to the environment and is not done that yeah. much in the United yeah. States. When when uh, Elon Musk gets busy, are we going to all of a sudden have a big ban? Yeah, it's a good question, I, and I I probably cannot answer that. I I the, the, clearly the uh, uh, that 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 is a concern. Uh, with the lead, with the lead acid batteries, we have a very good recycling, very high recycling process. That's not in place for lithium ion yet. There are mm -hmm. there are companies that say they can do this, but but the problem is there's very little reuse. Um, there's very little value in in an, in an old lithium ion battery. So so what? So when we like when it approaches end of life in the electric vehicles uh, or the UPS or the uh, uh, energy storage, great energy storage systems. There may be other uses, and that's being argued right now that there's still energy that can be used in other applications that doesn't need quite the full power of the battery, but they will still be end of life at some point. And, and right now, that is, it's a very good question. It's, it's an excellent question. That is still being worked out. Um, okay, but, 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 but with, with all the benefits, uh, people, well, people who benefit from this tend to overlook that side. Yeah, I thought the same people that were pushing for electric cars would be the first ones to complain about the environment. So that's the reason I asked. Yeah, yeah, the the it's yeah, that, that's a, that's a good point actually. But um, I I can't answer that one. I, I totally agree, but. Uh, um, I don't know where I don't. There are no guarantees in this right now. I I think everybody expects that this is this is the best. They, so obviously there are there's a lot of money being invested into uh, different or other uh, chemistries like there zinc or sodium or flow type batteries out there. But right now the lithium ion is 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 the it there's nothing really that can compete with the lithium ion. So at at this point that that. Probably that's what we have to deal with, um, and and people may forget some of the drawbacks for whatever reason. Brendan, does ABB um, actually manufacture any of these solutions? Uh, no. So ABB does not manufacture batteries. We we use batteries in a lot of different applications, obviously with with UPSs. And uh, and actually, that may be a, a, a good good question. We work with the, with work, and especially with lithium ion, we work very close with uh, with the manufacturers or a couple of manufacturers. And and we are not releasing anything uh, to be installed with an ABB UPS without having gone through a full test with the UPS and the battery. We want to verify that everything works safely. Not only, of course, the, UPA, the battery manufacturer have to go to do the uh, 9540A testing, and and then uh, we, we do the 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 full system testing, verifying that it works. Um, but ABB we don't ABB doesn't manufacture batteries, but very t typically uh, the AUPS is well, it's not really uninterruptible without a battery. So the the a product is typically the UPS. It's the energy storage solution, whether it's a battery or, or something else, or 
and very often also the uh, surrounding switchboard or switch gear. Uh, maybe only on the output side, some, sometimes on the input side, but but practically always the the UPS and the battery uh, is 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 bought from from the UPS vendor. Jurgen, is there any um, <clears throat> data centers um, or really other uh, critical power users who are uh, experimenting with uh, compressed air stored energy? Mm, you know, not that I know. Um, I actually, I'm, I'm not even aware that there's a, that there's a solution for for, for data center. There, there was the one one company was trying was working on developing a solution, and that goes back maybe 15 years, and that never materialized. So I'm I'm not aware that there are any uh, compressed air energy storage solutions that that we could use with the UPS today. Okay, uh, another question came in. What so has GE or ABB tested um, the larger UPSs with all of the different lithium ion um, chemistries? And are the UPSs available <coughs> in any of those battery chemistries? No, the the so th that's in process. So at at this point today, we we have uh, uh, one battery and actually one battery vendor that we have worked with and, and gone through the uh, uh, like all all, all the, 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 uh, the testing at Samsung, but but um, that the there are there are other vendors out there and and there's like typically would work with the, with the, with the media companies out there like LG Chem is is is, is another big uh, um, battery man or lithium ion battery manufacturer Saf, Saf could be another one um, that that we are working with like ABB being a we have a group of people actually sent working or looking at energy storage constantly are doing testing and working with the different manufacturers and then and then working with the different other product groups as to what might uh, what might work or be beneficial for the for the different applications whether like with a ups you typically you need a chemistry that that uh, uh power focused it's a short time backup with with an energy store it's also known as a best uh, best system um the it's it's more of an energy like you can be looking at, at two or four hours of, of backup it's more of an energy chem chemistry but they're not used only there they're also used in in uh, in in motion like even in boat like boats and locomotives and and other stuff are using bad batteries uh so if you make electric motors uh the the uh the the energy storage is is typically part of of the of the solution of course, in like renewables like wind and wind and uh, so solar power, that's actually that's where the grid the grid energy storage solutions typically come in. Is <clears throat> ADD works across the board in a, in a lot of different businesses. Um, so so that we have like like right now there will there will probably be B one that has gone through the ninety five forty a. Uh, but that but, but more is in pro more are, are in process. Does that uh, so? It sounds like to me, ABB does offer a product uh, for the battery yes. energy storage system. Is that correct? Yes, yes. If yes, if the specification calls for lithium ion, we have a product we can offer. And 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 currently, with, with after the uh, uh, there were. A, before NFPA 855 was passed, that we had a couple of different solutions that were approved. Uh, I've, currently, uh, uh, we work with Samsung that that has gone through all the testing, uh, and and we can offer lithium ion battery solutions with our with our UPSs. And and currently, that uh, that would be a Samsung. They they seem to be the not not. Um, not only for ABB, uh, uh, Samsung is a very big provider of, of, of energy storage for uh, for UPSs across the board. So, if, uh, with the battery energy storage system, would that is that a product that you're responsible for, or is that a different division of ABB? 
we well that would be that no it would be our group um uh, and we 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 are responsible for testing the uh, uh, the battery solution with the UPSs. So we we work with the, our group, uh, and and that that they be critical power. We work we work with the battery manufacturers. But there's a what could you call like like a a, a centralized corporate group uh, that's focusing on in, energy storage, uh, and that's what they do. It doesn't matter what the application is. For for our application, uh, we we work with the uh, with the battery manufacturers that can that can support our products. Okay, wonderful, uh, Jurgen. Boy, uh, your knowledge you know extends uh, deep and wide. Uh, so we're very grateful to have you, and uh, I'm sure everybody learned a ton. And uh, again, thanks. Uh, I think that wraps up uh, the questions and uh, hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you, Mark. So, I, just, just, yeah, thank And you know what? Sorry for wasting, like, at least going over time. Um, you're very welcome to reach out with questions if you have questions to anything. Uh, you think of something later. Uh, but thank you for your time.